You know, when looking at all of the captains of the Gote 13 as a whole, I think it's absolutely fair to say that some are more popular than others. And I think among the captains, the three that stand out to me as having always been the most popular are Hitsugaya, Byakia, and Kenpachi. Of those three, Byakia has always been my favourite. I've always found him just to be more interesting than the other two. I really like his design, and I think his Zanpakuto Senbon Zakura is both very creative, but also very visually and thematically intriguing as well. I really do like everything about it. But the one thing about Byakia that has always stood out to me the most when comparing him to his contemporaries, or even just to pretty much any character in the series, is he has one of, if not the best, most well-defined character arcs in all of Bleach. He really does have such incredible development when going from point A to point B. Byakya is a character whose journey encompasses all of Bleach's storyline and you really see him transform as time goes on. I've said it before that I wanted to do a video looking at Byakya's character development in Bleach and the time is finally now. However, before we begin guys, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to hit that button now. If you are a fan of Bleach, you are in the perfect place for content just like this every single week. And we have also just made a Patreon for the channel as well. If you want to support me even further, you can do. Um, any amount on there is, is tantamount to really helping me out. And it really helps me create these videos on a weekly basis for you guys. So if you want to go and join the people who have supported me over there already, that would be amazing. There's some cool stuff on there, including the Bleach fan comics I'm working on as well. So if you are interested, make sure to check it out. And any kind of support would be really appreciated. Among all of the captains in Bleach, I think Byakia has a really unique role in the story. He is truly one of the captains absolutely closest to Ichigo throughout the from the beginning to the end of Bleach. And I think that affords him some level of development that other captains are just never going to receive. Not only that, but despite the fact that the Gote 13 are the villains of the Soul Society arc, or at the very least the antagonists, Byakia is once again uniquely positioned in that arc as the main villain or the big bad of the Soul Society arc, where some of the captains are, it's definitely a little more ambiguous as to whether or not they're actually considered antagonists or not, but Byakia fully embraces that role of the big bad guy of the first main story arc, and I think again that affords him a unique position in the world of Bleach. So what do we know about Byakia as a character from the start of Bleach throughout that first main story arc? What are the foundations that this character arc are being built on? Well, we know he's incredibly powerful, he's famous, and one of the most revered Shinigami in all of the Gote 13. As a member of one of the most well-established noble houses as well, he's also in a position of responsibility. He is a role model for many aspiring Shinigami. There's a certain coldness to him which can come across as cruelty, especially when dealing with Rukia, his adoptive sister, in this first story arc. She is obviously being put on trial for having given her Shinigami powers to Ichigo, the whole conflict of this first story arc revolves around the Kuchiki family, and Byakya is that main antagonizer. He is the one seemingly pushing for Rukia to be punished at the full extent of the law. And compared to the Byakya we get later on in the series, this almost feels out of character now. It's really weird going back to the Soul Society arc and seeing Byakya just standing there awaiting Rukia's execution at the Sokyoku. So weird, in fact, that I almost have a hard time believing it. You know, I struggle to see that Byakya uh, in the Soul Society arc and think he's really okay with Rukia being put to death. Like, even if he is struggling internally with this decision, the fact that he even lets it happen, he's basically going to let it happen, is really weird to me. And he says things in this arc that I think are mostly just done to drum up that villainous status, but he has lines like, you know, I'll put Rukia to death myself, things that you can never imagine him saying 
at a later part in Bleach. But Byakuya is really interesting as a character at this early point in the story, especially when coming at it from that villainous angle. In many ways, he's supposed to be the model representation of a Shinigami. Powerful, stoic, law-abiding, uh, a master of pretty much all four of the Shinigami arts. You know, Byakuya is supposed to be all of that rolled into one. Um, and he does wear everything with this mask of cold indifference. You know, he is a noble and it's quite stereotypical that he holds holds himself as in quite high regard, he's quite aloof. But yeah, there is that underlying air of cruelty to every action he takes in this arc, which I do find to be really fascinating. I've mentioned it before, but the Soul Society arc does a really good job of taking the captains and splitting them into two halves. Um, it breaks out into a civil war over what's actually going on in this arc, and you get captains who are both on the side of law and order, and captains who are essentially on the side of righteousness, as it were. They're on the side of truth. The captains on the side of law and order are authoritarian, you know, they are all about following the rules, cracking the whip, and Byakuya is very much representative of that, which is fascinating because he does start breaking the rules later on in the series. And that's also where his relationship with Renji comes in and what helps make Byakuya stand out even further is this really fantastic relationship he has with his second in command. Renji obviously fully worships Byakuya to the point of wanting to grow strong enough to surpass him. But at the same time, the two of them couldn't be more different. And Rukia is right in the centre of that conflict, of that tumultuous relationship between Byakuya and Renji. Byakuya, again, as I've said already, is fully about following and respecting the law, the authority of soul society. Um, in many ways, Byakuya comes across as this, like, righteous hand of punishment that the Soul Society has, you know, he's willing to carry out and make sure that the punishment sticks. Whereas Renji, while perhaps believing himself to be like that at the start of the arc, we see his evolution earlier than Byakuya's. It's actually revealed that he cares very much for Rukia and wants her to be safe more than seeing this punishment through to the end. Um, and that's where the major clash comes between him and Byakuya. There's also the idea of class as well. There's a lot of layers to their relationship, I think, which I think is brilliant and honestly probably a video in and of itself. But it's fundamental to Byakuya's uh, character development that he sees Renji as being almost lower class than him at first anyway. Um, but Renji is the bigger man essentially by the end of the arc. But then, of course... Ichigo comes along, very much a reflection of Renji in many different ways, both of them the antithesis to Byakuya's hardened exterior. And we do find out, of course, that Byakuya is driven by this internal turmoil, essentially, this conflict he has where he promised his parents by their graves that he would forevermore uphold the law no matter the cost. You know, he would be that shining beacon to all other Shinigami, the, the role model for them, the example for them to follow. Uh, and unfortunately, that eventually puts him at odds with his own family, with Rukia, and he chooses the side of law and order until Ichigo is able to break through that exterior. And of course, his relationship with Ichigo would forever change and define his character moving forwards. This is the interaction that opens his eyes, essentially. Um, up until this point, he has been statuesque, you know, he has been fully driven by this idea that he has to follow and uphold the law. If he doesn't, as he says, who else will? Um, again, bearing this responsibility of nobility on his back and feeling he has to lead by example. Um, it's honestly really fascinating. I, and this is why I think this character is, you know, despite his popularity, despite being highly exposed in the series, there's so much to him that makes it worthwhile, I think. Um, and the fact that he plays such a major role in the Soul Society arc really does give him the edge compared to almost every other captain in the series moving forwards. His relationship with Renji and Ichigo is so well explored in this first arc that I, I really do I, I really do believe it, it gives us the foundation for his character's entire development moving forwards. But anyway, so Ichigo and Byakuya have their climactic battle 
which completely redefines Byakuya's values, while at the same time giving him a chance to explain to Ichigo his point of view. And to us as the readers, it's supposed to come across as, you know, insane. You can kind of see where Byakuya is coming from. He has immense responsibility on his shoulders now as the head of the Kuchiki household. But at the same time, you know, it's like you're letting your sister die. You know, and the fact as well, Kubo drops right at the end of the Soul Society arc this kind of notion that Byakuya can love. You know, you find out that the, his relationship with Hisana is evidence of his ability to feel compassion. You know, he's not just a robot. He's not just a statuesque, unfeeling machine, essentially. And so his love for Hisana help set up his character moving forwards. All of it comes together in the Soul Society arc to paint a picture of a guy who is trapped, essentially, um, stuck between his loyalty to his parents and the Kuchki name, but also to how he actually feels about wanting to protect his sister's life and, you know, protect his son's memory in many ways. Um, and also, again, from another angle, Renji berating him and Renji and Ichigo challenging his beliefs like no one ever has before. And and it's, it's, there's, a, there's so much depth to it. I think this is why Kubo does this character so well. You know, not only are they challenging his beliefs, they're also challenging the very class system that he has essentially made his own. And I think that's fascinating. Moving on, and it's safe to say that Byakuya never really has that kind of prominence again. He's obviously featured heavily throughout the rest of Bleach, continuing to be one of the most influential and popular captains in the series, but he doesn't have a role quite so prominent as that of the main villain. Um, and the change is quite swift. Right at the end of the Soul Society arc, he goes from wanting to see Rukia executed to allowing himself to be stabbed by Gein's blade to save her life. And it's that moment where Byakuya's ability to love really comes out. And then from then on, he kind of reverts back in many ways to the stoic Byakuya, the authoritarian Byakuya we've seen before, but the changes are already forming. You know, he secretly allows Rukia and Renji to go help Ichigo, despite that being obvious insubordination you know Yamamoto has forbidden Soul Society involvement in the Waco Mundo engagement and yet Byakuya has secretly allowed it this is already now showing a Byakuya who on the outside is more than happy to keep up this facade of someone who is following the law but really he's now more than happy to break the rules if it especially if it involves Rukia essentially and you get the sense that a little bit of Ichigo and Renji's rebellious nature has kind of rubbed off on him. Byakuya would then go on to be one of the captains who enters Waco Mundo to aid Ichigo's gang during their hour of need and I don't think this is any kind of a coincidence perhaps Yamamoto did just pick and choose people to send but the fact that Byakuya goes and arrives where Rukia has fallen doesn't seem like a, too much of a coincidence to me I think it probably was planned on his part and his fight with Zamari is again really I actually really like this fight I like the sinister feeling of it but Byakuya's development while subtle does come through here again and you get one of the most probably famous Byakuya moments ever where he pretty much just defeats Zamari with no real trouble, and at the very end, Zamari goes off on one about how Byakuya's only killing him because he's a hollow. Um, but Byakuya says, I'm not doing it for that, I'm doing it because you pointed your blade at my pride, referring to Rukia. And this idea that Rukia is Byakuya's pride is an interesting one, and one that forms the new foundation of his character. So he's obviously no longer playing the role of the main antagonist. Um, instead, he is now a supporting good guy uh, and his reason for doing everything is Rukia and it's fascinating because he's proud of Rukia proud that she holds the Kuchki name especially again when you consider the relationship they used to have where he wouldn't even look at her when she got an unseated position he was unhappy about that um but the reality is everything he's been doing, he's been doing to try and keep her safe that's why she hasn't been moved up through the ranks despite clearly being strong enough to do so that caring side of Byakuya, who cares so much for Rukia, is now essentially being allowed to surface, despite the fact that he's trying to maintain this image of the same old Byakuya from the Soul Society arc. He's fully 
all about protecting Rukia. And so his relationship with Rukia kind of remains that throughout the rest of the series. But it's his relationship with Ichigo where his development truly shines, I think. Byakuya appears briefly in the term at the Pendulum flashback, uh, which I find to be a fascinating glimpse at a completely different character, essentially. Um, so obviously this is over 100 years ago. Byakuya is a young man here. He's probably about a teenager. Um, and he's completely different. He's very hot-headed. He's, you know, prone to messing around almost. Like, he looks like he's willing to just drop everything to fight Yoroichi. Um, highly competitive, highly strong, not particularly focused, as Ginrei mentions. Um, and it gives us this sense that maybe this is what Byakuya perhaps would have been had his parents not died. Had his parents not died and left that burden entirely on his shoulders, made it entirely his to carry. Um, the Kuchki name bears a lot of weight and Byakuya bears the brunt of that. And perhaps the Byakuya in term at the pendulum, who's kind of willing to play these games with Yoroichi, who's, you know, highly competitive, like I said, um, and and more emotive, perhaps that Byakuya would have would have been around maybe a little bit more uh, had his parents not died and left him with that burden. So I think it is a fascinating glimpse into his past and perhaps a vision of what could have been. And then right at the end of the Iran Korak, Byakuya and Kenpachi show up to duke it out with Yami, who has been pretty much beating up Ichigo as Ichigo's hollow mask is kind of failing to activate. And this is another really nice moment. Um, Byakuya and Kenpachi are kind of sidelined during the end of this arc, but you do get a nice moment where Byakuya kind of says in a backhanded compliment that no one here, no one here needs your help. He's talking to Ichigo and he says that none of the captains need your help whatsoever. What do you take us for? But he then does say, you know, reaffirming Ichigo's position in the world. He's like, you are the substitute Shinigami of Karakura Town. That is where you should be. And this is a, it's a big moment for multiple reasons. Byakuya, you know, remember, considered Ichigo dirt. You know, he basically saw Ichigo as an abomination. You know, this abhorrent thing that was spitting on the traditions of the Soul Reapers. And remember, Byakuya, like I said before, in the Soul Society arc, fully authoritarian, representative of Soul Society's oldest and most rigid ways. Um you know, unflinchingly hating Ichigo's Bankai when it was first revealed because it was not the way a traditional Bankai was supposed to be. And now we've got him saying to Ichigo, admittedly in a roundabout way, but yes, you you are a part of this conflict. You know, you belong here. It's your duty to protect that town. Byaki is kind of entrusting him with the safety of Karakura Town in that sense. And I do think that's kind of fascinating. You then get a really nice moment again between Byakuya and Mayuri, where they both kind of feel each other out. And again, in their own roundabout ways, they both seem to have confidence in Ichigo that he will win the day and manage to defeat Aizen. And it's really, again, really nice that already Ichigo is growing in Byakuya's estimations. And this is nothing compared to what we'll see later on. But right here, at least, Byakuya is, at the, at the very least, willing to see Ichigo as a worthy combatant on their side. That's the main thing here. But of course, it's the Lost Agent arc where Byakuya's development really comes full circle in many ways, I think. Um, in this arc, we don't see him a lot, as we don't see many of the Shinigami until right at the very end. But Byakuya is tasked with taking on Tsukishima, possibly the most reprehensible villain we've had in Bleach and one who is personally targeting Ichigo and his bonds of friendship. And I have done a whole video on Byakuya versus Tsukushima. I think it's a great fight and I think it does wonders for Byakuya as a character as well. You have to understand the importance of the symbolism going on behind the scenes in this fight. Tsukushima is a villain who uses his warped powers to completely mess with established bonds of friendship, of love, of whatever it is. And he uses all of that to turn Ichigo's friends against him. So now the only person batting for Ichigo in this scene is Byakuya, of all people. The one person who despised Ichigo, who saw him as a blight on Shinigami history and tradition... Um, who slowly grew to sort of tolerate his presence and then like accept him as a combatant on the Gotei 13 side. Now, 
after Ichigo has more than proven himself by defeating Aizen and saving the day. But more importantly than that, it was Ichigo who redefined Byakuya's life by basically saying to him, you know, if it were me, I'd fight the law. I would fight the law for Rukia's life. I wouldn't do what you're doing and, and, and upholding it because of a promise you made to your dead parents. You know, I would, I'd fight it. And those words kind of changed Byakuya completely. And he he is now fighting for Ichigo's bonds, for the bonds that Ichigo affirmed to him were the most important thing in life. And I think that's phenomenal. It's great because Tsukishima does get Byakuya under his spell. He gets Byakuya thinking that he's actually his mentor from hundreds of years past, but Byakuya kills him anyway because he's Ichigo's enemy. And, yeah, I love that. I think it's so good. It's such full circle for the character who who was willing to sacrifice his own sister to uphold the ancient laws and traditions of soul society Byakuya has now changed to the point where he is he is the person who has Ichigo's back essentially to someone who understands the importance of those bonds to the point where he is willing to fight the literal personification in Bleach of those bonds being broken I think it's brilliant. I think it's, it's it's really, really great. But while I do love that scene, as far as I'm concerned, the best was yet to come for this character. Uh, and there are spoilers coming up for the Thousand Year Blood War arc. If you haven't read that yet, um, this next section is a spoiler. Obviously, Byakia, right at the start of the arc, after the initial invasion of the Quincy, is nearly killed by the Sternritter um, and left for dead. And what follows is, in my opinion, it would have been probably the perfect place to kill the character because it does it true it does truly bring things to a close between him and Ichigo. Byakuya, half dead, bashed into this wall, is just kind of standing there, unable to move, and Ichigo arrives. And obviously the place is in tatters, people are dying, Ruku and Renji are both unconscious, and Ichigo speaks with Byakuya in one of the most moving scenes in the entire series. One of my favourite scenes in all of Bleach, and I cannot wait to see it animated. But you never see Ichigo's face, so you don't get to see his reaction until right at the end of their conversation, which again is so powerful. Um, but Byakuya, rain running down his face, mixed with tears at this point, is telling Ichigo how he was unable to prevent this enemy from traipsing over the Soul Society. And what this does is it shows us that Byakuya still carries the burden of the name of Kuchki on his back. He still sees it as his responsibility to protect the Soul Society, maybe maybe more so than anyone else. You know, he, he feels he carries that burden as a member of nobility, as a captain of a, of, of a division. He now says that because of his inability to protect the soul society there will now be holes left in families you know people won't be going home at the end of the day because they've been killed and he wasn't able to do anything about it and now he stands here completely shamed and stripped of honor um and it's also fitting that the first thing he asks Ichigo is if Rukia and Renji are all right again affirming where his priorities lie nowadays um but the best bit obviously comes right at the end where he says, as he's crying, he says, you know, I don't have long left. I'm asking you now to indulge this contemptible man a single favour, one last favour. Please protect soul society, Ichigo. And it's incredible. It's so, so, it's so good. And then you see Ichigo's face and like the lightning flashing and it just shows like his shadowed form. And then you get the close up of his face and he's so angry. Um, but it's, it's beautifully done. And this really is the end of their relationship. This is everything summed up. Byakuya once saw Ichigo as not only an invader, but somebody who spat on the traditions of soul society, someone who was so reprehensible that Byakuya was going to end his life himself. And yet someone who shook Byakuya's foundations, someone who, as almost like a reflection of Renji, 
would go against the law to save Rukia, would show Byakia his own failings, even if he wasn't willing to listen to the truth. Now, Byakia is entrusting him with the safety of that same soul society. Not only has he accepted him as a member, essentially, of the Gote, he's also accepting it as its saviour. Um, and it's brilliant because Byaki even says to Ichigo, he's like, you're a human, you shouldn't even be on this battlefield. And yet I have to rely on you once more. Um, it's so, so good. It's so brilliantly done. It is one of my favourite scenes in the entire series and I can't wait to see it. The way I kind of envision it in the anime is just no music. No music. I hope you just hear the, the pitter patter of rain. And then it kind of, if they use the same soundtrack from the previous anime and then there's no music until it transitions to Ichigo arriving in front of Yuha Bark then I think we play the the Chokaku song from when Ichigo faces off against Aizen the kind of metal version of number one uh I think that'd be really good but I think no music when he's talking to Byakuya perfect and it just sums up Byakuya's development beautifully you know he's gone he's he's had a real visible character arc from day one starting off as cold uh ruthless cruel um but all because he doesn't want to accept the fact that he he you know he should be caring about his sister more than the law more than some promise he made uh more than the fact that he has to carry the burden of the kuchki name and then in the Iran car arc, you know, he's fully out in the open about the fact that he cares about Rukia and that he's willing to take down anyone who spits on that pride. And then as far as Ichigo goes, he's accepted Ichigo as a combatant that he's willing to to lay some responsibility on. In the Lost Agent arc, that has changed even more. Not, not to reverence, although the Soul Society does revere Ichigo in some form or another when we get to the final arc, but... Byakia sees Ichigo as such a comrade that he's willing to take up arms against even even his former mentor just to help Ichigo out. And then finally, on what he thought was his deathbed, he's willing to give everything over to Ichigo. Basically say to him, I need you to do what I couldn't, fulfill this last request and protect our home. And it's it's fantastic. You know, the, the guy goes from hating Ichigo, and but it's more than hate. It's seeing him as that blight on tradition. Tradition is so important to the Kuchikis and Byakia to, ha- to just giving everything to him. And and in his last moment, or what he thought was his last moment, it's Ichigo that he speaks to. And he's like, I can't, I can't do this, but maybe you can. And it's brilliant. It's fantastic. I could talk about it all day. Um, but... Well, there's one last thing I do want to talk about because Byakia doesn't really do too much after he comes back from the dead. But there is a lovely moment between him and Rukia, which again uh, kind of closes out their relationship nicely. So obviously up until this point, in the early stages of their relationship, Rukia is desperately seeking his approval. But Byakia has always been very cold to her, um, you know, barely even wanting to look at her sometimes because he thinks that she's weak and she's, you know, not really... Uh, not really upholding the Kuchki name, but really he actually cares about her a lot and he, you know, he obviously loves his son and all that sort of thing. But now their relationship has gone beyond just Rukia hero-worshipping Byakia and Byakia kind of just wanting to protect his little sister. Now Byakia knows and acknowledges Rukia's own power and is willing to leave as not to her. You know, this is the guy who eviscerated Byakia and Byakia's like, I think she can take you. You know, he's like, I think actually I can leave this to her. And Asnot sees that as a huge insult, obviously, but Rukia one shots him with her bankai. So it's a lovely moment. It's kind of like Byakia gives her approval to finish the job and use bankai. And it's, it's slightly more subtle than the Ichigo stuff, but it is still there. Their relationship has evolved to one of equality now, rather than Rukia playing catch up and trying to impress her brother. And the same kind of goes for Renji and Byakia, although unfortunately their relationship does kind of get sidelined a bit in the final arc. Um, But you do again get the sense that they are now more equal than ever before. Right at the start of the arc, they're kind of discussing how to face the Quincy's. And that's really nice to see a bit of of captain and vice-captain teamwork like that. 
But primarily, yeah, the main bit of development for Byakuya is in his relationship with Ichigo and how he perceives Ichigo and Ichigo's effect on the world they live in. So that is the crux of Byakuya's development and why I think it's one of the best, most realised character development arcs in all of Bleach. All right, guys, but that about does it for this video. Let me know in the comments below if you agree with me on Byakuya's character development. Do you enjoy it as much as I do? Or is there a character in Bleach you think is given a better, more substantial arc than Byakuya? I hope you enjoy the video. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to do that. Consider checking out the Patreon for more. I'd really appreciate the support. But until next time, guys, I'll catch you later. See you then.